Hello and welcome to episode 83 of The Garden Log with me, Ben Dark. I am a gardener and this is a gardening podcast. Today I'm talking about the, the last week of summer, the first week of autumn, which happily happened in the same week with a very clear cut down the middle. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this introduction, and so I won't. Let's roll at the week in gardening. Welcome to the week in gardening. I am recording this in autumn 2020, though the events of which I speak took place partially in summer 2020. I think we can call the dividing line between the seasons somewhere around 3.30 on Wednesday afternoon. So once you've listened to about seven and a half minutes of this description, then then go and get a woolly jumper on because we have crossed the line into cold winds and foretastes of things to come. Monday started hot. It was last days of summer heat, so not the flaying heat of June and July, but a drying oven sort of heat, a beetroot roasting heat. I catch the train every day after my, my gardening work is done and the train pulled into the station and uh, still bright skies and I caught a sight of myself reflected in the train window and I looked very dark brown and quite delicately corrugated. I had a face on the way to being a sort of withered conquer, the face that will, will keep me company in retirement. It's very unfair that the garden has done this to me. I spend all the time making it as pretty as possible, and all the while it ruins me as I beautify it, exposing me to all those UV rays. It's the same as as sacrificing our knees for the everlasting youth of the plants we tend. We have that Dorian Gray bargain with the flower beds. They remain always beautiful and fragrant, while we the horticulturalists age gruesomely in the potting shed. I suppose I can't complain. I would probably be getting older and uglier if I worked in the accounts processing department of an office, but but still it does feel slightly unfair. Anyway, what was I sacrificing myself for this week? I was re-edging some flower beds on Monday, which is a good, hard, late summer job to do. It's, It's a nice time to do it because the ground is rock solid which means that the grass on which you stand as you cut does not squidge. You don't need to bring out boards. It's like when you cut into a very hot fish pie. It all slides into the hole you've created. When you cut into a cold, refrigerated fish pie, you get a brilliant, sharp cliff edge. And I want that sharp cliff edge that comes from dry soil. So I did a nice little stealing of extra flower bed space. It's a constant gardener's trick, I think, because we realise, we know the truth, that grass is a lovely thing, but a little of it goes the long way. The impression of a lawn is not lessened by losing a metre of it to flower bed. A flower bed is lessened if you lose a metre of it. Gosh, what you can do in three metres of flower bed that you can't do in two metres, they really are worlds apart. So we tend to gently steal extra bits of territory. It's something that's probably not worth remarking on because so many do it. On Tuesday we had more sunshine, so I took out my my wide-brimmed cowboy hat for for its last day before it gets retired and replaced by a sort of yokel flat cap look. We had the machinery dealer around to show us a a top-of-the-range scarifier that I think we are going to buy. Our current scarifier is really a cylinder mower with a with a drop-in scarifier cassette and wire tines and it doesn't really work it's more like a a very very fast moving rake it is not that spiked cutting metal circles of ninja throwing star that you get on a proper scarifier and i think we're going to to buy it despite the the very, very high cost, because the grass in our in our areas of prime lawn really needs some 
proper intervention on it. It's funny, this is something that always strikes me when I'm, when I'm working on our fine lawns, is that I spent half my week desperately, desperately trying to create monoculture, and then the other half of the week desperately, desperately working on the meadow, trying to create as weedy and, and full of life areas as I can. And it almost feels wrong. It feels like I'm one of those incredibly dodgy carbon offsetting schemes done by a housing developer where they say, well, I, I will build over this this wetland. Thank you very much. It's OK because I've planted 36,000 spruce trees on some Arctic tundra. And you feel it's not really the same. This This biodiversity effort should be going on everywhere. But anyway, we need a fine lawn for which we need to do interventionist policies. Scarifying, to go back to basic basics, is removing this thing called thatch, which lurks underneath the grass in any lawn. It is the bit prior to the grass blades turning green, that browny bit that if you if you comb your, your lawn's blades apart, as if you're a parent searching for, for nits in a child's head, you'll see... There are lots of hay brown stems. And it's commonly thought that this is dead grass escaped from the mowers collecting buckets. But that's not true, actually. If you, if you dig and rootle around in there, you'll see that it's, it's really a live grass. It's the root sheath of, of the leaf. It grows very long as the grass tries to find its way through a very dense lawn. And sometimes you might find that you have a lovely two-inch blade of grass growing straight up but actually it's rooted four inches away and it has this long snaking almost above the surface root to it and this is not particularly required in the very very fine lawn it causes a few problems it encourages new grass and new seedings to to root into the thatch itself and it causes problems for the mower and creates an unstable cut. A lot of people, when they think they've scalped the lawn, haven't really scalped it. They've just cut down into this thatch. And the, the best way to regard it is as a layer of sponge. Now, if you've got a layer of sponge over your lawn, it makes cutting very, very difficult because the mower is more wobbly. Imagine if you were a, a skinhead and you were heading out to do skinhead activities and you needed to get rid of all of those those telltale little follicles and you're trying to shave your head but uh, you have a, a layer of sponge between the, the, the blades and your skull it would be very hard to get a decent cut the razor would be wobbling around all over the place it would be cutting in in, in different bits and you'd end up with an altogether unsatisfactory bleeding scalp and the sponge also also takes in the water, which means there's less water in the soil for the actual roots. And there's more water above the soil for fungal problems, which, which come in these, these monocultural, unnatural zones of pure lawn grass. And so the idea of the scarifier is to, to clear out all of this stuff, to cut through those, those long brown leaf sheathy bits so that all of the grass regrows straight up without all of this noodly layer of nonsense. It looks absolutely appalling when you've done it. You've hired a machine or bought a machine as we have it at multiple thousands of pounds and run it over and created something that, that looks as if a battle has been fought upon it. And sometimes you have to be firm with your clients about why on earth they are paying you to do this horror to your lawn. But you will, you will create a better lawn in the long run. It creates a vast, vast amount of green material as well, or, of bits of grass and bits of soil clinging to it that can all go into the compost heap, which is quite useful for us at this time of year because now we're going to get huge amounts of leaves coming down and it means that we can extend the active composting season, still creating a really, really hot heat for the rest of the year. So that was very exciting. It's always lovely as well to see the machinery dealers because they spend their life going round to the top gardens, visiting head gardeners and trying to sell them bits of kit and their inveterate gossips so you can find out what's going on where. And it's sad at this time because most of the story is of decline in budgets, in staffing, 
of furloughs slowly turning into redundancies. So this was particularly heartbreaking. But in happier times, you might be able to get a bit of veiled gossip about who's done what to their, their prized garden and who's tried something utterly ridiculous and of course destined to fail on their bowling green. You have to be quite careful, of course, because, because machinery dealers' view of gardening comes from the mechanic's garage school. So their solution to any problems is obviously a new bit of kit, uh, and you need to read between those lines. But it is a wonderful window into the wider world of horticulture. That took most of Tuesday along with other sundry bits and pieces, and we moved on to Wednesday. And here we were doing the carbon offsetting part, the opposite of the thatch removal. We were working on the meadow. My colleague was in at 6.30 to, to get some scything done as the, the grass still had its, its coat of dew, which makes things easier for the scythe. It, it means that there's something to, to grip to and that you don't just slide over the back of very, very dry grass. I, as the less skilled partner in this particular operation, was doing the heaving cut grass around into a giant heap on which we will one day grow pumpkins. And it was amazing what I was finding. At the end of the the cart run, when I emptied out the grass, at the base of the cart were the most amazing host of creatures, all of these little scurrying, squiggling things, vast, vast amounts of soldier beetles and black beetles and earwigs, and devil's coach horses and flea beetles of, of various sorts, and cardinal beetles and crab spiders and thick jaw spiders and ants and everything, little crickets. It was fantastic to see what lives in this grass that had been lawn, that had been treated in a similar horrible machinery dealer's paradise of scarifying before, but is now home to all of these fantastic, fantastic species. And hopefully, once they were all flung onto the heap, they'll be able to creep out and, and find themselves home again for the coming year. The heap's in the, in the corner of the, the meadow, so they should get out fine. And most of these things that I'm talking about are, are predator species, which means there are probably countless others, almost too small to notice, gone down into the soil, scurrying away. The, the stuff that I was moving would left for a week to let the seeds get out of the heap and then also let the animals disperse from it. So they're probably gone by now and all, all the predators are just searching through the heap. So we, we are really, really creating something quite magical on the microscopic and and just about macroscopic level here. I don't know if that is penance for all of the fertilizers we're dumping on the on the fine lawns. It feels a bit like sort of buying an indulgence to, to get your way into heaven, but I suppose we, we must make these these compromises. And then I shifted the compost we have a new digger. We have a new very exciting electric digger. And I was experimenting with that. It's not nearly as fun as the diesel digger. And I realized that I come across as the exact sort of person I, I dislike when I say that because I've never had any sympathy with a sort of petrol headed person who would say that now the thing is the crucial part of driving is is the roar of the engine, the, the throb of the, the combustion. I have never felt that as a particularly convincing argument. But uh, somehow on a digger, you do want a bit of roar and throttle and fume. And this digger is very silent, apart from a sort of ominous whirring noise that you might find in, in a warehouse or a factory or if you were passing a very high voltage energy generating system somewhere and it just seems that something's missing which is a huge huge hypocrisy on my behalf because I spend an exaggerated and very very tedious amount of time tedious for those around me complaining about cars and engines and and fumes I'm cycling into work, of course, and there are more and more cars on the road as lockdown progresses and they're getting bigger and bigger and shinier and shinier. And you think of these the horrible the things producing toxic air everywhere. I see them around me as well, the invasion of, of Range Rovers and, and huge great things like that. And you think that if we took them away, if we took away the, the shiny outside and the nice dashboard and actually looked at them as 
as these collections of oily pipes producing toxic air. And they're crawling around our little cities and lurking on every road and every car park near us. We wouldn't take it. We'd be up in arms about the the cancer-producing stuff. We'd go out and we'd set up roadblocks and trap them and beat them into little little bits of metal. And we don't. We don't at all. We we say, well, we're completely natural that we'll have all of these these engines toddling around our cities. And yet, and yet, here I am mourning the loss of the the digger. I'm also, of course, a hypocrite in many, many other ways, in eco areas and lifestyle areas and, and everything, really. I have a car, it sits on the street all week until I go to the big Sainsbury's, and it's taking up the space that a good big tree could take up, or on a flower bed. And it's not needed at all, but, but it's there because it makes things convenient. It's very hard, very, very hard being a human, isn't it? Anyway, the, um, the digger was, was fine, it did, it did its job. But I did feel like one of those horrible old cigar smokers who'd gone outside for a puff on a vape pen and said, well, not quite the same. Nicotine's there, but it doesn't go well with the brandy. That's that's kind of my, my attitude to the digger. I'm sure things will, will change as I get used to it. Thursday was spent looking after my son. It was a lovely day. And on Friday, I was back to work. The bottle border arrived. And it was a very ominous, ominous delivery of bulbs because it was unloaded with a forklift truck which speaks of blistered palms to come over the next three months. I think we've got 12,000 plus bulbs, ranging from small snowdrop bulbs, which it feels unfair to to count in that 12,000, to big fat hyacinths and and daffodils and camassias. I'm not going to go through all of them now. I'll give more of an update as we go through the the planting process. We created a nice storage area with nice racks so none of them can get particularly mouldy so there's airflow around them and also so they are visible so that we don't have that escaped 300 tulips, the the missing half of a a planting pairing that I'd planned out in in midsummer found tragically slightly mouldy in February so hopefully we can see what we have and work through it in a coherent scientific manner. I thought there was no time like the present to get going almost breaking the back of these it's like starting writing an essay. The the first few words are the hardest so I, I went out and popped in some snowdrops. It's a lovely feeling and it's almost like uh, a treat for for those future versions of, of myself and the people I work for. Something that has been buried with love in the hope that they will find it and appreciate it. And they probably won't. I'm like a, a parent doing lovely things for their child every morning and the, and the toast is buttered and the shoes are by the door. And do they notice? Of course they don't. They just storm on by. People will probably just rush past these, these snowdrops on the, on the way to somewhere else. But they all are part of, of the environment part of creating this magic in a garden that doesn't stop, that doesn't have a non-switch at the beginning of April. These are just plain old Galanthus nivalis, the single-flowered common snowdrop, because the effect that I'm going for is mass planting. I want the, the shining horde. I want the unmelted snowdrop on the lawn rather than a beautiful collection of terracotta pots where we can raise them slightly and look into the the flower of the snowdrop and and recognise that, my goodness, this this has three layers of ruffle and an extra dot. We're not being subtle in that way. We're going for for mass effect. And with those in the ground and autumn having having come upon us, I went home on, on a chilly, chilly Friday. I'd made plans to meet friends in Regent's Park after work, made the plans rashly on the Tuesday evening, where all was honeyed light and warmth, and so so met them on a bench, shivering in in the cold, watching these these geese and mute swans huddle us slowly across the water, and it felt a, a, a very different night from one that I'd envisaged, but then it got dark, and the open-air theatre started to play, and the lights shone out across the grass, and it felt comfortable and cosy, and Suddenly the nights were longer than the day, and it was the start of a new season, which is invigorating. 
in a way. I've just bought some new work boots, which I think must be a legacy from, from all of those trips to, to Clark's on the high street in early September. Your brain has this September time for new school shoes thing drummed deep, deep within it amongst its many other unwanted legacies. And this came out, so now I've got lovely, shiny, cosy feet and nice coats on, nice flat felt cap, and I'm ready to take on the, the worst of the weather, which is something you will no doubt hear about in future episodes. Until then, let's see if there's any recommendations this week. No real recommendations this week, though I would like to say how sorry I am for all of the people in our industry who have found their hours cut or their jobs having disappeared completely because of, of the COVID crisis. I know there has been a lot of, of coverage, particularly in the horticultural press, but, but elsewhere as well, about the jobs lost at National Trust and, and other places. But it's not just there, it's it's all of the, the small hotels who have no income from, from weddings and who are having to, to save money on everything, gardens included. And those who have lost work due to fairly, fairly understandable and sensible discretionary cutbacks in private households. I know it's a, a very, very tough time. People aren't advertising new jobs at the moment. No one in a stable job is thinking of moving on so there aren't new opportunities coming up and it's just really 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 rotten out there for a lot of gardeners as podcast listeners it's, it's very hard to do anything for the individuals but we can carry on going to gardens those that are open and spending money and, and spending money at nurseries and we can donate to a charity. There's a charity called Perennial that supports gardeners who find themselves in in problems either out of work or, or going through stress or, or mental strain. So if you are moved by, by the plight of these poor, passionate people who aren't paid a great deal of money in the best of times, who don't have cushions to, to fall back on, then it's really, really worth going along and giving a, a donation to them because they can help a little bit. I can't help by by taking on any new staff, much as I'd like to, but if there are any gardeners near near where I work, on the, the edge of the Beaconsfield, High Wickham, Children's Bit, who have found themselves made redundant from from their jobs and would like just a day or two's work planting daffodils, in a meadow, then they can email me at thegardenlogpodcast at gmail.com. It's not enough to, to make any real difference, but it would be a couple of hundred quid and a, and a sympathetic ear. And otherwise, go and go and donate a little bit to Perennial. Just go and search for Perennial Charity, and it will come up with, with ways to donate. On to happier things. We have a huge plant order arriving next Monday, which signals the start of the planting season, signals the start of getting things ready, putting in place the pyrotechnics for next year. It's something that I've been looking forward to for a long time. There are some bits of manky box hedging and old, oh the grown, miscanthus filled grass beds that are going to fall under the spade and are going to be replaced with incredible, vibrant, bright, recovery beds, bright new future beds, and I'll be talking about those in the next episode of The Garden Log. I do hope that you will listen again when that comes out, and until then, have a wonderful time whether you get into the garden or not. Thank you very, very much for listening, and goodbye.